Good morning, everyone. Today is March 23rd, 2023, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Jean Lawler and I are delighted to host another cutting edge webinar for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and everybody who negotiates. As you all know, there's no charge for these great programs. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you're in a position to do so to help people in need with food insecurity. And one of my favorite parts of the program every week is when we announce the running total of how much our generous audiences have contributed in honor of our great speakers. Jean Lawler, would you please do the honors? With pleasure. And it's interesting here, we're talking about food today and giving and donating to food banks. So perfect tie-in. Um, 373419 dollars 31 is the uh, number in terms of donations of which we've been told. So that's, you know, I think that today we will go over that 375 mark, and that is more than 4 million meals served. It's just fantastic. So thank you all. Wow. Incredible generosity, both on the part of our great speakers for donating their time and our very generous audiences for the contributions they've made. Today, we have a really fascinating program, Microbes at the Mediation Table, How Might Food Choices and the Gut-Brain Connection Impact Dispute Resolution? There's tremendous scientific research about the relationship between the gut microbiome what we eat and what happens to that food inside our body and the way our brains function and the way we make decisions. It influences our foods, can influence our basic emotions, pain sensitivity and social interactions and can even guide many of our decisions. In this presentation, we will take a look at possible implications of the science in the field of dispute resolution, field in which we all work. We have a wonderful presenter, Teresa Frisby, professor is a distinguished professor in residence and the director of the dispute resolution program at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. A former partner at the litigation law firm of Foreign and Schultz and experienced mediator, she has taught negotiation, mediation, mediation advocacy and international arbitration to judges, lawyers, law students, business executives, physicians, and nurses in the United States and internationally. She also coaches Loyola's successful international mediation team. Teresa was named the 2018 Mediator of the Year by the Association for Conflict Resolution Chicago, and both a top 10 women neutral and a leading lawyer in the areas of alternative dispute resolution and employment, ADR Commercial Litigation, and ADR International, as voted by her Illinois peers through leading lawyers. Teresa has a JD from Loyola University Chicago School of Law, bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois. Teresa and I have worked together on articles, including one wonderful, particularly wonderful article we published in Law 360 in 2020, regarding mediation confidentiality in the interstate online environment. I can tell you from my personal experience, it's a real pleasure working with Teresa. We also worked with her terrific student, Tyler Codina on that article. And I can tell you, it's, uh, she's a wonderful scholar and professor. We're very happy to have her here presenting to us. Teresa. Would you please tell us a little bit about the food bank to which you would like people to direct contributions if they're in a position to do so, and then give us some food for thought. Okay. Then, my friend, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for the really kind introduction. And I am just honored to be part of this program. These have been such interesting presentations and for such a good cause. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a slide about the Greater Chicago Food Depository. <clears throat> this is a, an excellent organization in Chicago that's been around for years, and they partner with 700 organizations and programs all around the city and throughout uh, Cook County. <clears throat> and please forgive me, I have a bit of a cold, so uh, it may 
<clears throat> struggle with my voice a little bit today. Okay, so let's talk about microbes at the mediation table. So, you know, Jeff had asked me, uh, what if I gave a presentation uh, combining my interest in nutrition and mediation? And as I've done this research and delved into it, <clears throat> I realized that this presentation may be initially more useful as uh, information about our own lawyer and mediator mental health. And I was so struck by the presentation on lawyers and suicide recently. So I hope you find it really helpful in that way. And <clears throat> then we can also look at some possible applications to the mediation field. My own interest uh, in this started with my own physical wellness journey uh, and learning to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. And then I started uh, connecting this. I noticed how many anxious and depressed law students we have. So three years ago, I started teaching a wellness course in the spring here at Loyola, and have just you know continued to uh, learn more and more about wellness. And that led me to this recent science that uh, shows that we may have the ability to improve our mental health and our cognitive performance through our food choices. Big disclaimer here, I am not a health professional, dietitian, therapist, any of those things, right? I'm a, a lawyer who became a mediator, who became a teacher. But um, so I have to say, always consult your medical professional before making changes. I also want to take a minute <clears throat> to acknowledge my own food privilege, because the a lot of the foods I'm going to be talking about are not easily accessible to everyone. Uh, and of course, this whole program is dedicated to people that don't have easy access to food. So here's the learning objectives for this lecture. Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to explain the gut brain axis in mental health, list foods and ingredients that support helpful bacteria, as well as unhelpful pathogens in the microbiome. Describe how food choices and probiotics are related to mood and cognition. And help me brainstorm ideas to improve outcomes and mediation through food. I've, I've come up with a few ideas, but I'm sure uh, there are many more ideas that we can add. So we already know some things about food and conflict resolution. Uh, I think it's pretty generally accepted that sharing a meal helps us see the humanity in other people. Um, there are many, many instances throughout human history of using meals for peacemaking. Uh, and then there's some recent science. There's a, uh, a study that was reported in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, for example, students who ate together while negotiating were able to come up with uh, more valuable, profitable results in their negotiation. And I saw that Lee Hornberger commented, I think on the LinkedIn um, promotion for this about a uh, specific instance, and maybe Lee can tell us more about that at the end. I'm gonna take questions at the end, but um, so, you know, this is kind of part of what we're talking about, but not what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, I am gonna take a minute just cause I think this is so interesting there's this new uh, entry into the field of public diplomacy called gastro diplomacy or sometimes culinary diplomacy. And it's, it's using uh, in, you know, knowledge about your country's cuisine to actually foster cultural understanding. And Thailand, I don't know if any of you noticed this, but I, you know, I didn't know about Thai food and suddenly there was a Thai restaurant everywhere. And this was actually a program by the Thai government called Global Thai, and they helped people, um, Thai citizens come to the US, open up restaurants, and that has worked. They have uh, more tourism, it's in increased their exports. Uh, so I think that's a really fascinating trend. Uh, and here's something else we kind of already know, right, about, about food and conflict resolution. You know, you're not going to want to let the people participating in the mediation, you know, let their blood sugar get too low. I know some mediators use this actually as a tool, trying to make people feel some discomfort and want to get things concluded and get out of there. 
Um, I'm not sure that's the, the most ethical way to mediate. Um, you know, but we know this, right? Hangry, the combination of the words hunger, hungry and angry. Um, we've all experienced this with, you know, people that we know. And what's happening is there's actually this cascade of hormones that get triggered, including the fight or flight uh, hormones. And also low blood sugar may also interfere with higher brain functions, like controlling impulses and regulating our behavior. So what we are going to focus on more is this newer science about the mind-gut axis. I heard uh, Dr. Emron Mayer speak actually here at Loyola, and he's written a book called The Mind-Gut Connection. And he points out that when we eat refined, sugary, processed foods, we're actually undermining our own ability to manage stress. And this is because of inflammatory changes in the body and the brain. And it's through this internal world of these symbiotic microorganisms called the microbiome. And to illustrate the power of the microbiome and what's, uh, what very tiny organisms can do to your brain, he tells the story about um, the life cycle of a particular parasite that needs to go through both the cat and the mouse to complete its life cycle. It's called Toxoplasma gondii. And essentially what happens is the mouse's brain gets hijacked and it actually becomes attracted to the cat, right? Which is gonna eat it. And I remember after his lecture, I took the commuter train home and I ran into a lawyer that's my neighbor and described this whole thing to him in detail. Uh, he may never view me in quite the same way again. Um, but it is a very dramatic illustration of this principle. You know, so what we're talking about is we are not alone in our bodies. And, and most people have no realization of this. We share our bodies with trillions of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes. Just among the bacteria, there are a thousand species. So these microbes are mostly beneficial, right? They help us digest our food by breaking it down, produce vitamins, promote the immune system. And if you have a very healthy and diverse microbiome with uh, all these good bacteria, then there isn't room for pathogenic bacterial species to colonize in your gut. So this is just unbelievable to me. One human has between 10 to 20 trillion human cells, but 40 to 100 trillion microbes. And I was just reading something recently that was leaning towards the, we are only 10% human cells. So, you know, we're at least half or, or less than half. Rob Knight, who's one of the leading researchers in this field, uh, talks about it being like a jungle or a coral reef. We're essentially a walking ecosystem of microbes. And we have a different microbiome in our digestive tract than we have, say, on our skin or our eyes or ears. So you have different colonies around your body. <clears throat> you know, and I we've recognized this in our language, right? We've, we've felt that there's some connection between our gut and our brain and, you know, all of these expressions that we use, gut feeling, sick to my stomach, go with your gut, illustrate that. And of course, Hippocrates 2,500 years ago was talking about that all disease begins in the gut and bad digestion is the root of all evil. So in a, in a sense, we've known this for a long time, but now the science is exploding uh, and all these new books are coming out describing the actual details of the science of how this works. So here's a particular scientist I'd like to focus on, Dr. Uma Naidu. She wrote, this is your brain on food. And she is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. She's also a professional chef and a certified nutritionist. So she brings all of these things together. 
And she describes that what we have is a second brain in the gut that has between 100 and 500 million neurons. And it's really interesting because the, both brains originate in the same tissue in the embryo. The vagus nerve is the big nerve that connects the second brain to the brain. And then there's chemicals that are produced by the gut that reach the brain and vice versa. So there's all this, this back and forth. And then the mechanism really is uh, inflammation, right? So this mayor calls it the microbial mega highway from our gut to the brain. And it can dictate behavior, mood, and even personalities based on the level of inflammation. According to Dr. Naidu, the food you eat can have just as profound an effect on your brain as the drugs you take. And again, disclaimer, always talk to your doctor before you change your medication. So one thing that's been pointed to as a reason for this is that 90% of the receptors for serotonin are actually in the gut. And serotonin, most people are familiar with this, um, it's been believed to be a neurotransmitter that regulates mood and fear and a general sense of well-being. I do have to point out, and again, I'm not an expert in this field, but there was a big uh, meta-analysis published in 2022, really questioning this low serotonin theory of depression. So um, just making you aware of that. Okay, so let's go back to the, when they started developing this science about um, actually what's happening in your gut impacting the brain. And this was one of the most important studies. So this yogurt study involved uh, 36 females between the ages of 18 and 55. And for four weeks, they had three groups. One group was eating a probiotic yogurt two times a day. Group two was eating a similar product, but it didn't have probiotic in it. And group three had no yogurt. And they did brain scans before and after the four weeks. And what they had the uh, participants do was match faces expressing various emotions. And what they found is that the, the people that ate the yogurt with the probiotic had actual changes in regions of the brain related to emotion and sensation. So that was a very exciting development. So it's really a two-way street, right? So you can have these gut sensations that then impact your brain and the emotional centers in your brain, or you can have emotions that then cause you to have gut reactions. Something else to talk about in this context is a concept called leaky gut. So leaky gut relates to, there's a protective barrier in your intestine where the um, you're supposed to have what are called tight junctions. So what happens is when there is, um, maybe you're exposed to toxins or you're stressed or you're eating food that isn't very good for you, those junctions um, won't be tight anymore and the metabolites and chemicals can leak into the bloodstream, and this actually reaches the brain and causes inflammation. Uh, here is a study um, just this month that shows that consumption of probiotic foods and a higher intake of fiber can lower levels of depressive symptoms. So this is really, really exciting that this is being developed. Uh, here's a couple of interesting scientists. Uh, Ted Dynan and John Crinan of the University College Cork in Ireland uh, have done a lot of research about microbes in the brain. And they, you know, they point out that you only have four pounds of these microbes in your gut, but uh, they are regulating your unconscious behavior. So here they are with their book, The Psychobiotic Revolution. Uh, and they have um, done 400 scientific articles together. They've done a lot of a lot of research involving mice, um, which is you know kind of hard to read about because they they put these mice in situations that uh, make them anxious. <laughs> but um, 
what they're showing is that what we eat has a direct impact on our microbes, which influence brain function. So for example, they raise what are called germ-free mice. So they are raised in a bacteria-free kind of bubble. And when they do that, they exhibit autistic-like social traits. And then when they were able to show that when they gave them a probiotic, it reversed these autistic symptoms. Uh, in another experiment, they fed a different probiotic to anxious rodents and that de decreased their anxiety. And it's, um, it's kind of distressing to read about, as I said, you know, they might have them, it's one of the tests is how hard does the mouse keep trying uh, when it's in water to, you know, swim to safety. Um, they also showed uh, a fecal transplant decreasing anxiety. Anyway, they've done lots and lots of experiments. And their theory is that it's the bacteria that want us to socialize, right? So <clears throat> you think back to early humans, you know, they really needed to cooperate to survive. And the gut bacteria played a role in making them want to socialize with each other because that would benefit the bacteria, uh, creating more opportunities, more real estate for the bacteria to live, which is a pretty wild idea. Um, I've listened to various podcasts about this stuff. I remember somebody talking about uh, humans being meat puppets, um, which is a pretty mind-blowing concept. Okay, so where do we get the microbiome? Well, initially from the birth process. So uh, when the baby comes through the birth canal, the baby picks up the mother's microbiome. If someone has a C-section nowadays, a smart physician will actually gather some of the microbiome from the mother and put it onto the baby. So the baby has that good start in life. Uh, and breastfeeding also uh, promotes the microbiome. Uh, the environment plays a role. So are you, you know, exposed to say microbes that are in the soil? Are you exposed to toxins that can damage the microbes in you? And then of course, food, because we're eating food every day. <clears throat> and it's pretty well established in early childhood. I've read between uh, one year and three years, but all through your life, these various things have an impact, right? So food, prebiotics, probiotics, antibiotics. If you take an antibiotic, it wipes out the good and bad bacteria. Um, other medications can have an impact. Stress has an impact. Uh, and this goes on throughout our lives. So let's take a minute and talk about what are prebiotics and probiotics. So a prebiotic is a non-digestible food ingredient that promotes the growth of beneficial microorganisms. Examples are whole grains and then, you know, all kinds of fruits and vegetables, you know, from artichokes through yams. And a probiotic is the actual food or supplements that contain live microorganisms intended to maintain or improve the good bacteria. Sometimes it's also called the microflora in the body. <clears throat> so the best way to make sure that you have a healthy microbiome is uh, to eat the right food. And unfortunately, in the United States, most lawyers and clients and mediators are eating the standard American diet. So that's processed foods, additives, trans fats, all these things that we know are not good for us. Uh, weed killers like glyphosate, Roundup. Um, and other chemicals. So all of these things, you know, I, I'm someone that's of course looking in other people's grocery carts, <laughs> shocked by <laughs> what they're going to put in there and what it's going to do to their microbiome. Uh, people have no idea. Uh, <clears throat> one good way to get probiotics is uh, from fermented food. So it's amazing as I've looked into this, uh, fermented foods have been part of human history uh, in so many cultures. Here are some of the most well-known, right? Yogurt, pickled vegetables, kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, dark chocolate, kimchi, tempa, miso. If you're going to um, buy 
a product, always look for the words contains probiotics or contains live cultures. Vinegar can be on this list um, if it is the kind that's kind of cloudy, which is the, it's called the mother. Um, as I looked into this, okay, we just have to spend a moment looking at this list of these probiotic foods. Uh, I had not heard of <clears throat> so many of these. Uh, you know, cortido made out of cabbage and onions, pulque. I recently went to Mexico and uh, had an interesting experience. We we rode horses out in the countryside outside of Mexico City uh, with a family that had a hacienda, and they took us on this long tour. And one of the things they showed us was um, this former pulque factory that was part of, it was originally a part of this, there was a Jesuit mission from 400 years ago and this family bought this, uh, it's just all deserted. And then they showed us the remnant of the huge pulque factory that used to, they, they were, you could see where there had been train tracks and they went from there to Mexico City. They used to produce 20,000 liters of pulque a day. This is what everybody in Mexico was drinking. And when the Coca-Cola company came to Mexico, uh, they began to discourage drinking pulque. And uh, so now you still see it if you're, if you're out, um, there's an area of Mexico City where you can go out on a boat and you know past all these gardens and people will come along and uh, sell you pulque or some food or um, maybe some rugs, things like that. So it's still in the culture, but um, I thought that was astounding. You had a whole country drinking this fermented drink and it just completely stopped. <clears throat> this list goes on. Fermented walrus in Canada. That's pretty interesting. Uh, stinkhead fermented, fermented fish in the USA. So this has been an important part of human health for a really long time that is mostly being ignored. So most common probiotics are the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium groups. And probiotics have names that of course refer to genus species and then the particular strain. So like for bifidobacterium, lactis BB12, um, that tells you all three, right? But you usually see this with just an abbreviation like B something or L something. Uh, here's another article. This one is about um, fermented food consumption uh, and its impact on social anxiety. And I just think that's so exciting because that's I, I, I see that that is, um, especially with our law students, um, that's certainly part of the anxiety that they're suffering from is social anxiety and the thought that you could eat fermented food and not suffer with that um, is, I think, really helpful. Okay, so back to Dr. Naidu. Her book is just excellent. And she actually gives examples of food for specific mental health conditions. So here's an example for ADHD, foods to embrace. She recommends breakfast and not too much coffee. And then polyphenols, which are so healthy. And here's you know a bunch of berries, cherries, eggplant, onions, kale, coffee, green tea, certain vitamins, certain minerals. Uh, I want to take a moment and point out that magnesium, um, many, many people are low in magnesium in the United States because our soil is depleted. And I'm guessing that that's probably true in other parts of the world as well. And then she points out foods to avoid. And these are kind of across the board uh, foods that can trigger an inflammatory response in a lot of people. So not just related to ADHD. Gluten. Uh, certainly if you have celiac disease, but many people also have uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity or intolerance. So not only do you need to avoid bread, pizza, and pasta, but many alcoholic drinks. Dairy, specifically A1 milk casein. So that's that's the protein. Um, so that's not being lactose intolerant. That's, that's reacting to the actual protein. Uh, but you can use other kinds of milk, nut milk, goat or sheep milk. And then, of course, sugar, which has hundreds and hundreds of different names 
Uh, so you have to get good at reading labels and searching out what's actually sugar. And then of course, high fructose corn syrup is, um, we know, so terrible for us. And food colorings and additives, people are not paying attention to that and the impact that that has. So the basis of this recommendation, she goes on to show, uh, here's the study behind it, right? So this is a study of 95 people. Some people got a special breakfast bar. Some other people got a control bar. And then they tested their cognitive function. And the people that got the special bar with these specific nutrients were actually tested and were more alert and attentive and could process information more rapidly. So it really directly relates to helping ADHD. And then she goes on and, and replicates the nutrient bar with this smoothie recipe. So this is an extremely helpful book. I highly recommend it. Um, and I know looking at a list like this of ingredients can be really daunting if you're not somebody that's used to eating in this way. Um, but the thing is you do get used to it. She even has a newsletter, the mood food of the week. And uh, last week she wrote about cabbage and uh, how it's helpful for depression in, in these several different ways, right? It has sulforaphane, which is reduced uh, neuroinflammation and has the right vitamins and it has folate. And that also has been linked to depression. Uh, so anyway, I highly recommend her work. Another really good book is The Anti-Anxiety Food Solution by Trudy Scott, and she zeroes in on nutrient density. So uh, these are some things that are very nutrient dense. Organ meat, I know a lot of people just can't think they, you know, I cannot do or, organ meat. You might want to try just like a pate, um, bone and vegetable broth. I make bone broth all the time in my instant pot. And um, it's really easy, it takes a couple hours and then you get the same nutrients that you would get if you had cooked it in a conventional way for more than 24 hours. Fresh herbs, apple cider vinegar, typically anything that's the entire organism, like if, you know, if you're eating an oyster, uh, has a lot of nutrient density. Uh, and I have to take a moment to point out that for some people giving up alcohol or coffee can be extremely helpful with anxiety. So this field is, uh, this emerging field is called nutritional psychiatry. And a, a lot of practitioners are beginning to use diet as a treatment recommendation. Okay, what about probiotic supplements? They're not regulated by the FDA. So you're kind of on your own. Uh, I mean, the best thing to do is talk to your doctor about it. But I found a resource, consumerlab.com. That's really helpful. It's they they review the products, they test the products to see if what's claimed is actually in the bottle. You know how many units for when you're looking at probiotics, for example, you would look at the number of colony forming units (CFU). It should be at least a billion, and then they actually make recommendations and say, you know, these ones aren't recommended. These ones, the price per pill is really good, and it's a good product. Uh, so that's. That's one avenue for figuring out which ones. Dynan and Cryon actually go ahead and make recommendations in their book. So these are the brands. Most of these I think you could get in the United States. <clears throat> and they go so far, and this is, you know, this book is now several years old. So I'm sure there's uh, more information, but they actually pinpoint specific mental health issues and which bacteria will be helpful with those. And of course, this, this science is still emerging, but you know, how hopeful for down the road, if you, and it's not just for health, mental health, it's also for other health conditions, looking at what bacteria you might be missing in your microbiome. <clears throat> okay, again, I'm not an expert on probiotic supplements. I can recommend the advice of Michael Paul and eat eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And then I would say eat fermented food. There are people that um, may have a health issue that prevents them from eating fermented food. So talk to your doctor about that too. But really you have to notice what makes you feel good or bad because we're all so different genetically and we're all being exposed to different things. Uh, and so it's not a 
one size fits all proposition. Teresa, I've heard, I think it was on Dr. Mark Hyman's podcast, a very simple rule. If it's made from a plant, eat it. If it's made in a plant, don't. Okay, there you go. That's a good rule. Uh, here's a new study from um, just this month. And they showed that probiotics improve depression symptoms in humans. And they actually could observe changes in the brain looking at an fMRI. Okay, so applying this to mediation. Well, you should feed them. I don't think you should let them get hangry and feel that distress and just want to get it done and get out of there. Uh, I think um, the easiest way to do this is have people um, order lunch when they arrive in the morning. So maybe you could pick a restaurant with plenty of salads and other healthy options. I mean, what's tricky is we have so many mediations that take place in one day, right? So if you're doing like a maybe a family law mediation where people are coming week to week, you could approach this differently. I mean, we're not seeing that you can change your microbiome and it's going to impact your brain just based on what you're eating today, right? I believe you might feel a little better, but I don't know that it's going to have the impact of, say, eating yogurt for four weeks with probiotics. Um, what about those cookies? So, you know, we, cookies are such a part of mediation. On the one hand, if you eat something that's very high glycemic, uh, what can happen is after a couple of hours, your blood sugar could actually be lower than before you ate the thing that was really sugary. So that might make you think, well, you know, don't offer things that are really sugary, but there's more to it than that. So I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with this study already about the parole judges in Israel. Daniel Kahneman writes about it in Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, I just think it's, it's such an important study for our purposes because it's about decision-making. These parole board judges, you know, they were making decisions every six minutes all day. And I think parties in a mediation uh, are kind of in the same situation where they're making decisions about the offers that are going back and forth. And um, in this study, uh, which was done by um, a university in Israel, they looked at the cases and you can see like, here's these examples, case one, two, and three. So case one's at 8.50 in the morning, an Arab Israeli serving a 30 month sentence for fraud. Case two at 3.10 PM, a Jewish Israeli serving a 16 month sentence for, and I can't see my notes, uh, something else. And, uh, and then case three, 4.25 PM should be like case one, right? An Arab Israeli serving 30, a 30 month sentence for fraud. Uh, and of course the only person who got parole was case one. And it, this totally had to do with the timing of the rest and, and meal breaks. So these judges got a sandwich and fruit at 10.30 in the morning. And just before the break, people had a 20% chance of parole. Just after the break, they had a 65% chance. And then just before lunch, a 10% chance. And after lunch, 60% chance, briefly. Uh, I feel like I've been at this motion call where you're, you know, <laughs> By the end of the morning motion call, nobody is getting a motion granted. But it's this is um, depletion, right? Decision fatigue, and, and glucose does play a role. So I think you have to maybe keep the cookies around. Um, this is another study about um, self-control and glucose. This was actually um, kind of a meta-analysis that Galet and Baumeister did, and it's... Um, I read about this in an article by Ernst in the Dispute Resolution Journal in 2014. All these different things that are part of self-control are profoundly affected by fluctuations in glucose, controlling attention, emotion regulation, refraining from aggression, coping with stress, right? This is, all of this relates to mediation. 
So Teresa, let me ask you, you had some very critical things to say about sugar, and then you also said you might want to keep the cookies around. In many mediation companies, they have big jars of candies and chocolates and things like that. Is that what you recommend we feed our clients when we're in person, or are there other things that would be better for us and them to have handy? Well, of course, I'm going to say we should have the better things, right? Um, and uh... but like, like what? Okay, so I, I'm getting. I have a couple slides about that, but I, you know, okay. I think you could have uh, much healthier food, but I can't. I mean, here's the thing. Any caterer will tell you, okay, go ahead and order the fruit tray, but they're not going to eat it. They're going to eat the tray of cookies over there, right? So I suppose you could say, well, if you didn't have the cookies, then they'll eat the other things. Um, but this glucose issue is so important. If somebody's not eating anything, they end up in a bad place. So, you know, here's a study where... Um, you know, just one of the studies that Gallat and Baumeister looked at, men with low glucose levels from fasting had more impulsive behavior and included all these things, lying, reckless behavior, arriving late to work, acting selfishly, exploiting others. Okay, so here we are now at some ideas, Jeff. Uh, yes, I think you need some better snack options. You know, apples, citrus fruits, low glycemic, granola bars, it's hard to find them, right? Because if you look at the labels, they have a lot of sugar in them, but um, cut up vegetables, you know, I would sure be grateful being at any event where these things are available. Um, what about chocolate? So I think we all have a sense that chocolate makes people feel a little better. Uh, this is a recent study that I just think is fascinating. They looked at a group of people eating 85% cocoa dark chocolate, right? Compared to a group that was eating 70%. And what they found, um, and they were eating 10 grams of chocolate three times a day for three weeks. And what they found that chocolate is actually a prebiotic, right? So we remember a prebiotic is something that feeds the good gut bacteria. And it increased the specific bacteria, Blaudia obium which makes butyrate, which is known to reverse depressive symptoms in rats. So this is the actual mechanism of eating dark chocolate. Um, so I would say, I can't, I can't say don't have any chocolate or cookies, you know, but try to have these other things. Of course, be sensitive to food allergies. These are the main ones. We're all pretty familiar with this. Uh, egg, fish, milk, peanut, shellfish, soy, tree nuts, sweet, sesame. Um, be sensitive to culture and religion, right? Uh, right now there's fasting happening in a, a couple of uh, the world's main religions. Um, and it can last for just a few hours or even a few weeks. So you wanna, before you say, let's all have like a meal together, you wanna maybe find that out. <clears throat> Another thing to think about is, you know, this comes up, when you're trying to eat something yourself as the mediator during a long mediation day, I think you're better off either eating with everybody together or um, just by yourself. I think what happens sometimes is the mediator ends up eating just about nothing <laughs> because you're going back and forth. Um, but that's, you know, you want to maintain your neutrality. Okay, so, you know, I am open to brainstorming Here's some of the things I thought of, you know, I know if you can invite them to a meal, you know, Jeremy Lack does this, you know, but he works on these great big cases where, you know, people are in town the night before and they can get together. Um, what if you tell them some of the science, maybe there's something you could send out to the, the lawyers and parties ahead of time about preparing for mediation and, and part of it could be um, telling them to take good care of themselves in the days and weeks before the mediation. Because we do know that even though your microbiome is pretty much set in early childhood, um, it can be impacted and can, and can change at least temporarily by what you're eating in just a few days. So maybe you could, I mean, I don't know, you know, are we brave enough to tell people what to eat before they come to mediation? 
you know, should we be suggesting they eat yogurt or some probiotic food? Um, I don't think we could say take a probiotic supplement because I think you have to do with that, uh, you know, do that with your doctor. Um, I would recommend they try to get good sleep because that impacts your microbiome as well. And then, you know, again, these are some of the things you could serve as healthy options. Green juice, people might be willing to have that and get one that's not too high glycemic. Uh, you could remind people to be moderate in consumption of alcohol and caffeine leading up to the mediation. Um, but this is as far as I've gotten. So I'm, I'd love to hear from our participants uh, how you manage food at your mediation, what your ideas are based on um, this presentation about the microbiome. So I'm Teresa, gonna stop here. This, was, this was terrific and, and thank you. I have a couple of questions. We've written articles together about mediation in the online environment and mediation confidentiality, but we haven't written about food and nutrition in the online environment. When people are in our office, we have some control over what is served. When people are at home, we have no, no control really over what's in their refrigerators. What do you think is appropriate? What are some guidelines? We don't want to appear patronizing or like we're running a nanny state. Uh, what's, a, what's appropriate for a mediator to say or do if somebody looks like they're getting cranky? It can, can we say, have you had any protein in the last few hours or are you hydrated? What, what, what do you think is appropriate? Well, I think that we could uh, suggest a break, right? And then say something along the lines of, you know, it might be helpful to take a break for people to, you know, whatever you may need to eat or drink or just have a few moments to think things over. Um, I, you know, like I said, I think that making kind of general recommendations with the aim of everybody um, wanting everybody to be in a place where they can do effective decision making would be appropriate, right? And some kind of pre mediation communication. Um, I, to me, the science is really convincing, right? And so this is like, I like to present science to the students because I think that's maybe more convincing than just somebody saying, eat your vegetables. Um, but food is so emotional and food is cultural and food is, you know, people have so many feelings about it um, that there's only so much you can do. Well, and also we have people in different time zones when we're mediating online, sometimes in different continents. So one person may be a little cranky because they're up too early and haven't had breakfast. Another person may be a little cranky because they're up too late and haven't had dinner all at the same time. Any tips on managing time zone differences in the online environment? Uh, well, um, I would say just being sensitive and also being informed. I have an app I really like called Time Buddy. It just shows you, you know, in a linear form, like here's where you are in this this is what time it is for them. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, just being courteous and realizing that, you know, for somebody, it may be really late at night while it's still the work day here. So the, the idea that sometimes you hear about in mediation of depriving people of food and making them want to settle because they're hungry and just want to get out of there and have a meal, you're recommending against that strategy. You think the decision making is going to be better if people have appropriate food in their systems. I do. Um, but, you know, it's happened to me, right? Where you have, um, say, like, for example, the Chicago Bar Association, the, the way the mediations are set up is that it's supposed to be a four-hour time slot. And then if you can't get it done, you keep going. And, um, you know, sometimes the parties are just, you know, oh, of course, we're not going to need lunch. We're going to be out of here. Uh, and then everybody is talking a whole lot and it takes longer. And then they say, oh, no, I'm good. And all of a sudden it's 2.30 um, and you, you've you fallen into the, the trap. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I think insisting right from the beginning of the day when you're in person that, uh, you know, let's order lunch and assume that that's what we're doing is a good way to proceed. Yeah. 
What do you eat for breakfast, Teresa? What's your breakfast? <laughs> well, uh, I eat a lot of um, buckwheat and it's actually uh, full of protein and I make it in my instant pot and I can put some blueberries in there. Uh, I also can tolerate eggs. So I'll eat eggs with a big pile of greens. Um, sometimes I'll make a big smoothie with a lot of kale and some frozen berries. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, this is how I get in these conversations is because I'm eating differently than everybody. People ask me why, and then we get into a discussion. Uh, and usually what happens is it turns out somebody at the table either has an autoimmune disease or knows somebody that does and um, and then we're off to the races because I can tell them a lot of helpful information. And they seem to appreciate it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Terry Walls is a scientist out at the University of Iowa who was in a wheelchair. She has MS. And she decided to research what, what does your body need to make myelin to cover your neurons? And... Uh, there was a lot of science out there. And so she created this whole diet and she's written a book called The Walls Protocol. And for people that have MS, they can reverse symptoms through diet. So, I mean, there's just fascinating science out there. Now in many, many times when we're in person, mediation runs late. The reflex is to say, let's send out for a pizza. That seems to be kind of a, a default response. What's, what's your view of that? Well, it's so funny because I don't want to be the party pooper, but I think about this all the time because every event that we want to get the law students to come to, we offer them free pizza. And, you know, I'm just like, you know, we have on our 15th floor of this building, we have a full reception hall with a professional kitchen. And I think the law students should all be up there making salad together for lunch every day. So um, the problem is pizza is inexpensive, everybody likes it, and that's what they're going to want. So just go with it, is your Rick, your thought, if that's what people it's, want? Well, yeah, because it's, it's kind of like the cookies and the chocolate. It's better than if their glucose completely crashes, right? We know that that's not a good situation. Yes, and, and beer and crudite just doesn't have the same ring as beer and pizza, does it, for the law students? <laughs> No. So, so you can see, I'm, I'm struggling to apply this to our field. Uh, you know, this certainly is helpful for lawyer and mediator well-being, um, but it's, it's trickier when it comes to making it happen at mediation. Yeah. Th this is bone broth, by the way, in case you're concerned about what Excellent. I did early in the morning. We have a few <laughs> minutes, perhaps there are questions from others in the audience. Uh, just unmute yourself if you wish and ask your question or type it into the chat, please. Lee Hornberger, you posted a lengthy comment. Would you care to share some of that? Basically, that uh, this is Lee. Base, I'm in Traverse City, Michigan. It's wonderful here. Um, basically, what I posted and I'm sorry I didn't put the link in for it, is a Michigan Court of Appeals decision where somebody was trying to set aside a mediated settlement agreement, and they said they did not have food for a nine-hour mediation, and the circuit court and the Court of Appeals affirming enforced the MSA in part because the person had been given food during the mediation. So I don't want to overplay the card, but at least in Michigan, there's solid case law for providing food at mediation. I think the food of choice is bagels and cream cheese. Okay, so the whole idea of self-determination, and if we're not giving people food, are we negatively impacting their brain functioning? and really allowing them to exercise informed self-determination really ties it back to one of our basic values as mediators. Yeah, Other thanks for sharing that. Yes, thank you. Other thoughts or comments that people would like to uh, unmute themselves and, and share? 
So Teresa, let me also ask you, when you go to a mediation in person, do you bring a little bag of celery sticks or something like that with you? I mean, you know, I know a lot of people yeah. put a stick of a protein bar or even a candy bar into their pocket or purse, whatever. Yeah, I, I what, find what you, that. What do you carry around with you? Okay, I carry around uh, protein bars. I carry around uh, a particular brand of um, very clean jerky, turkey jerky uh nuts because i can tolerate nuts um i have found that if i try to have a big salad I, there, I get two bites of it and somehow i'm back in the mediation and i, I just don't have time to do that so uh-huh uh, at the risk of being overly uh, commercial are there brands that you you mentioned some brands that some of the other authors found good what, what do you favor okay so um i I Nick sticks they're called is the jerky um Nick's with an N Nick yeah Nick sticks and um and then you know I'm still trying to find the right bar because they all have some dried fruit in them and that is actually pretty high glycemic but um you know Lara bars lately I've been eating but but you know it's tricky and it's all very helpful to know as everyone pays attention and struggles sometimes with figuring out how to balance convenience with nutrition. Right, right. Well, this has been a most illuminating presentation. And I think there is, there is uh, no pun intended, there really is a lot of food for thought here for all of us, Teresa. Thank you very much for taking the time to prepare and deliver such thoughtful remarks to us. To those who are in a position to do so, please support the Greater Chicago Food Depository. That's www.chicagosfoodbank.org, www.chicagosfoodbank.org. And to everybody who was here, to Natalie, Jean, Teresa, most of all to you, thank you very much. And with that, we are complete. Thank you. Good to see everybody.